This time on Superstars, five hard-kicking action heroes you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. Chinese Kung Fu legend Jet Li was just 10 years old when he won his first national championship in the martial art of Wushu. Legend has it that when his troop traveled to the US in the early 1970s, President Nixon jokingly asked him to be his bodyguard. Jet replied that he didn't want to protect just one person and that when he grew up, he wanted to protect his one billion Chinese countrymen. By the age of 17, the big thinking boy from Beijing had already embarked on a film career, which began with the 1982 film Shaolin Temple. After becoming a star in mainland China and Hong Kong, he jumped on the Hollywood bandwagon to play a baddie in Lethal Weapon 4. He'd agreed to play a villain for the first time in his career for a chance to star in the 2000 action flick Romeo Must Die. The film, which also starred Isaiah Washington and a liar, was a souped-up telling of the Shakespeare classic. Although the romance was somewhat watered down, after Jet insisted that a kissing scene between him and a liar was cut from the end. My friends call me Akbar. Akbar. Well, Akbar is Mac, Mac, Akbar. <laughs> the romance was clearly alive and well in his real life, after he turned down Chow Yun-fat's part in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. After promising his second wife, Nina Lee Chi, he wouldn't work while she was pregnant with their daughter, Jane. Four years later, he got to play a real-life hero. He was on holiday with Jane and her younger sister, Jada, in the Maldives, when the devastating tsunami hit. Guiding his daughters to safety through the flood, he injured his foot and made the headlines. His holiday coincided with the delayed international release of his 2002 Chinese Wuxia epic, Hero. Directed by Zhang Yimou, the story was loosely based on the legend of Jing Qi. And Hero had already become the most expensive and highest grossing film in Chinese motion picture history. Jet Li's spectacular sword skills, not to mention the film's stunning direction and breathtaking cinematography, won a nomination for Best Foreign Language Film at the 2003 Oscars. The commercial and critical success of Hero, however, left Jet little more to achieve in the realm of epic martial arts. And in 2005, he jumped sideways into an action thriller by Luc Besson. In Unleashed, his character Danny has been raised and trained as a dog by a ruthless loan shark, played by British veteran Bob Hoskins. Hello, Danny. Hey. The violent but bewildered Danny is then befriended by a blind piano tuner. Portraying such vulnerability was a huge departure for the action man. I played more than 30 films. All the time he's, he's the master, or the hero, or the man, save the family, save the day, save everybody. <laughs> the character, not me. But this is first movie I need a save by somebody. Still, he was able to dig deep and find inspiration for the conflict within the character. Because I, in the real life, I met a lot of people that are physically very strong, they look like a tiger, they can kill you in two seconds. But the, the, in their heart, it's very warm, like a rabbit. They're working like a rabbit. But when they're fighting, oh, it's really powerful. Bob Hoskins, however, was finding it harder to see the warm side. Well, at the moment, my only experience of working with Jet is being beaten up by him. So, um, well, I'm hoping it's going to improve. The following year, at the age of 43, Jet dipped his toe back into the martial arts epic for one last time. Fearless, directed by Ronnie Yu, tells the life story of heroic Chinese martial arts master Hu Huanya throughout the early 20th century. Jet's decision to retire from playing the hero in pure martial arts movies was motivated by his belief that he had achieved everything he'd set out to and now wanted to act in other genres. Divided by war. Not that he's totally turned his back on action movies. In 2008, he finally caved in to the persuasive powers of fellow Chinese action star Jackie Chan. Kind of 
he kind of like a Chinese treasure, protected because he's a, he's a world champion martial art. We, we, we met each other in Hong Kong. Then I said, hey, let's make a movie together. Protect yourself! In the Forbidden Kingdom, the two martial arts experts teach Kung Fu to an American teenager who travels back in time to ancient China. While Jackie reprises his character from his iconic 1978 film Drunken Master, Jet plays the dual roles of a silent monk and the monkey king. Having finally persuaded Jet to work with him, Jackie has big plans for their collaborative future. Professional wrestlers are well known for their pantomime antics in the ring, but few have successfully made the leap to the slightly more subtle art of big screen acting. And while WWF favorite Hulk Hogan did manage to string together a few minor television and film roles in the 80s and 90s, it is Dwayne The Rock Johnson who has truly blazed the crossover trail. After retiring as the WWE undisputed champion in 2002, he landed the highest paid debut starring role to date in The Scorpion King, a spin-off prequel to the Mummy series. While most other first-time actors would have gone wobbly need at the prospect of carrying a $60 million movie, The Rock was unflappable. I thought, wow, what a fantastic opportunity. You have the, the built-in audience of The Mummy Returns and the first two Mummy series. My only, one of my concerns was I want to deliver. For, the, for this audience, for the mummy audience. But then he wasn't doing it alone. And I've always said that, okay, well, I'm gonna go do a movie, and I'm gonna take some time off from wrestling, but I'm not gonna go by myself. I'm gonna bring all my fans with me. We're all going to make the movie together. The support from his fans definitely helped in making the film a box office success. The Scorpion King grossed $90 million in the US, and while critics didn't love the film, the consensus was that The Rock rocked. Bigger salaries and more roles were forthcoming. In 2003, he got paid $12.5 million to mix it with Mother Nature in Welcome to the Jungle. It was sweaty, it was dirty, there was monkeys everywhere, there's bulls everywhere, and the bulls had upset stomachs because they don't know we're filming a big movie and they're treated very, very well. They think, you know, they're hearing blasts and gunshots, they've got diarrhea, I mean, it's the worst. I gotta pull up with Sean William Scott, Stifler, it's like, oh, please, these minnows that will swim up your little ding-a-ling and drive you crazy. <laughs> With many commentators already crowning him the new Arnold Schwarzenegger, he was pleased as punch when Arnie dropped in on set. He came by and it was very innocent. We were just having lunch and the director had said, hey, do you want to have, uh, do you want to be in the movie? Arnold's like, yeah, sure. And it surprised everybody. He's like, wow. And within minutes we were on the set and he's like, yeah, I want you to have fun. And it, so it was, it was really, like I never thought it was going to turn into this big passing of the torch iconic moment. I just thought, Oh, wow, it's cool. <laughs> of African-Canadian and Samoan descent, The Rock's chiseled features, square head and buff body give him a somewhat cartoonish outline, which no doubt made him a no-brainer for casting in 2006's big-screen version of the video game Doom. The same year he starred in the true-life football drama Gridiron Gang, about a detention camp probation officer who turns a bunch of hardcore young offenders into a football team. Not your way. Your way got you here. Whatever he certainly can. didn't have to be press ganged into the role. I watch a documentary. I, it's really that simple. I sat down with Neil Moritz, who's a producer, and he said, listen, I think you're the guy for this. I watched that documentary and I was moved. I cried, I cheered, I laughed, it was sad. It was all those things. Uh, and I said, I'm in. I would love to do this. After all the death and destruction of Doom, he was happy to play a positive role model. You try to, and you have that responsibility. But I think ultimately, um, you know, we have that responsibility just as adults, period, just to take care of our kids. So for me, being in the position I'm in, it's non negotiable. You know, and I accept that. I accept that responsibility. No problem. If I can make a movie like this, that's entertaining 
and maybe can help kids, great. If I can make a comedy, you know, that's entertaining and give somebody, uh, you know, a laugh, have them get away for a couple of hours, that's great too. By 2008, he'd softened up even more to play a macho football player who bonds with the eight-year-old daughter he never knew he had in Disney's game plan. Thinnaman. I'm allergic to thinnaman. Fatherhood changes all of us. <laughs> That's what happens, and I think especially um, from the from the father perspective, and not only that, but I also think. Uh, from uh, the father-daughter perspective, when you have a little girl, there's nothing like daddy's little girl. You know, and there's nothing that unique bond, there's nothing like that unique bond between a daddy and his little girl. Hi, everybody. I'm In real life, Dwayne is father to seven-year-old Simone. Having had plenty of practice at playing dad at home, he was a natural on set, according to his young co-star, Madison Pettis. I don't know why people call it work. It was just like I was going to play every day. It was uh, so cool. And Dwayne was just like a daddy to me, like on screen and off screen. He was always asking me, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Because he always wanted to make sure I had a healthy breakfast. <laughs>past a certain age, I like more mature type of role. And it's difficult to have those roles at the age of 20. You still have that baby, baby face. Baby face. And uh, when you have more mature script, the pages are becoming like, um, like skin. Right. And you can become the character. And I'm not really a big fan, and God bless them, of big, big action movie with lots of computer graphics, CGI explosion, who doesn't make really sense to be able, as a hero, to fight, let's say, a country. So I like to be involved into being an action character. Okay. Who has... And that's what who suits you, the action yeah, character. Yeah, who has, who has a feel for life. Lucy Liu's first slice of the action came in 1999, when she played Princess Pei Pei in the comedy romp Shanghai Noon, starring Luke Wilson and Jackie Chan. But she had to wait until the following year to really get her kicks by playing special agent Alex Munday in the big screen version of 70s TV hit Charlie's Angels. Alongside Drew Barrymore and Cameron Diaz, she jumped and punched her way in and out of trouble under the direction of music clip maestro McGee. With its heavenly blend of butt-kicking action and slapstick comedy, the first film made off with $258 million worldwide. Its runaway success 
gave birth to a 2003 sequel called Charlie's Angels Full Throttle. This time, Lucy started taking out the good guys. Lucy stepped on on a push off my my hand. She missed my hand and hit her went thigh. and punctured my thigh basically yeah. with her heel. And I had a big, huge weld all the way down my leg, which was kind of nice. She she observed it and she said it was artwork every day. I don't know if it's making day. me feel better because I said <laughs> no, it was. It's artwork every day. Perhaps she was just warming up for her role as the evil Oren Ishii in Quentin Tarantino's Splatfest Kill Bill Volume 1. Training for the part was intense. Chinese martial arts and Japanese samurai sword training was completely different because um, samurai swords are very heavy and you have to hold your body in a very specific position where you don't bend over. You have to have your back straight at the, the entire time and you have to be squatting. So it's an intensive workout on your thighs and on your forearms because of the sword. The New York native has proved that she's a woman of action off the screen as well as on. In her real life capacity as a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF, she recently flew out to the Democratic Republic of Congo. The scene of the deadliest conflict since World War II it's estimated that 1,200 people still die there every day as a lingering result of the conflict. As part of a mission to provide DRC with the basic tools they need to survive, Lucy visited centers for former child soldiers and survivors of sexual violence. She also met with communities that have been displaced due to the ongoing conflict to help raise awareness and publicize the issues. She's also been active in raising awareness about human trafficking in Asia. And in 2003, she took a huge drop in salary to play an HIV-positive woman in the film Three Needles, drawing attention to the improper treatment of AIDS in China and Thailand. In Europe and in, in North America now, there's, it's very rare that someone who will die from AIDS and HIV because we have the cocktail, we have all of these other medicines and, and prescriptions and pharmaceutical breakdowns of what we need to do in order to, um, as well as a huge awareness of, you know, you have safe sex and all those things. And other parts of the world, they don't know. Children are boiling needles or, or just rewrapping needles because they want to make money. Their, their first instinct is survival. In 2006, she took on the role of executive producer for the documentary Freedom's Fury a film that dramatizes the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. The first time a crime lord asked you to kill the gay son of a rival gangster. The same year, she agreed to star opposite Josh Hartnett and Bruce Willis in the independent thriller Lucky Slevin on the strength of the script. Nick has been painting me in the corner since we were kids. I'd love to hear the rest of this, but I really got to go back to work. Oh, hey, hey. Able to speak Chinese, Italian, Spanish, and Japanese, Lucy attributes her talent for multitasking to her Taiwanese heritage and says she's happiest doing 10 things at once. Other strings to her bow include a flair for art. Over the past few years, her collages, painting and photography have been showcased in three gallery shows, with the proceeds going to UNICEF. She's also partial to rock climbing and playing the accordion, although probably not at the same time. Born in 1962 in Orlando, Florida, Wesley Snipes is a fourth dan black belt in Shotokan Karate. His early training in martial arts probably came in handy while growing up in the Bronx, where he attended the famous high school for the performing arts before making his film debut in Wildcats in 1986. After appearing in several Spike Lee films, he started making a name for himself in movies like Passenger 57 and Demolition Man, opposite vintage action man Sylvester Stallone. But it was in the 1998 action flick Blade that Wesley really came into his own. As well as starring as the titular vampire hunter, he also served as fight choreographer and producer. Blade raked in $128 million worldwide, opening the door to two sequels. But while his professional life was kicking along nicely, Wesley's personal life was falling into disarray. In the mid-1990s, while on probation on a California gun conviction, he was charged with reckless driving after engaging in a 120-mile-per-hour chase with the Florida Highway Patrol. 
Then he had to face claims that he had fathered a child, following a liaison in a Chicago crack house. Wesley twice refused to take a paternity test, declaring he had never met the woman and that she was a delusional crack addict. His case was strengthened by the revelation that she had made similar claims about President Clinton, Prince and, wait for it, Oprah Winfrey. Eventually, another man agreed to take the test and proved to be the father. The case was thrown out, with Wesley countersuing the woman for the embarrassment the affair had caused him, as well as a New York judge who ordered him to take the paternity test and Indiana prosecutors for pursuing the woman's fantastical claims. But all that was little more than a minor inconvenience compared to the tax fiasco that was beginning to unfold. In 2006, Wesley found himself charged with one count of conspiracy to defraud the United States, one count of making or aiding and abetting the making of a false and fraudulent claim for payment against the United States, and six counts of willfully failing to file his income tax returns. During 96 and 7, he allegedly attempted to claim a false return of nearly $12 million. It was also claimed that between 1999 and 2004, he had failed to pay any tax at all on an income of around $38 million, even after he was informed that he was under investigation by the Internal Revenue Service. The investigation was hampered by Wesley's disappearance. In 2005, he was stopped at Johannesburg International Airport, allegedly in the process of trying to use a fake South African passport. His valid US passport allowed him to leave the country, but his immigration status suffered as a result, with South African authorities dubbing him undesirable. Then it was on to Nigeria, where he was given the full red carpet treatment. The local media speculated that his visit might spark a wave of foreign tourism and investment in the local movie industry. Hi, Wesley. The president has asked me not only to welcome you to Nigeria, but to welcome you to Abuja and give you special treatment. But if Wesley had been hoping his problems back in the US were about to be resolved by scoring a Nigerian passport, he was about to be disappointed. He has asked me to confer on you honorary citizenship of the city of Abuja. The token offer wasn't going to solve his problems, but he remained gracious. Thank you very much for your hosting. Thank you very much for your interest and your patience. Finally, he was tracked down to Namibia, where he was shooting his latest film, Gallo Walker. In December 2007, the US Inland Revenue Service ordered him home to Florida, where he was indicted and released on a $1 million bond to finish the film. As he left the airport, Wesley was still protesting his innocence. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wesley Snipes, for those of you who don't know who I am. Uh, I want to say thank you to all my fans. Thank you for the support from my family and to my foes. Thank you very much as well. Uh, I look forward to vindicating myself. I look forward to clearing my name and uh, continuing on the, the, the pursuits of establishing uh, international exchange of the arts and uh, the upliftment of humanity and in, in, in African people around the world. Thank you very much. The case finally went to trial in January 2008. Two months later, after being convicted of failing to file a tax return, the judge recommended he serve the maximum prison sentence of three years.